Hello everyone, and welcome to episode 68. In the previous episode, I explored the evolution of the fungal kingdom. It was a more general overview kind of episode, and I mentioned a lot of different fungi, from the chytrids to the ascomycots, and almost everything in between. Well today, I'm going to dig deeper into the fungal kingdom, and spend several episodes exploring the main fungal lineages in greater detail. Naturally, I'll be starting way back at the evolutionary origin of the fungi, more than a billion years ago. This will take us to a time where the fungal protozoa, the earliest fungal ancestors, had just emerged. They would soon diversify into a menagerie of simple fungi, whose diverse lineages would collectively become known as the monocaria. I'll explore the early fungal protozoa and the monocaria today, and move on to the dicaria in the later episodes of the series. And as I cover this initial material, what I really hope for is that you'll get a deeper understanding of how early, primitive, single-celled microbes gradually evolved and acquired the traits that turned them into modern fungi. We'll start with the early protozoa, and we'll end with the zygomycota, which I think should sufficiently illustrate the fascinating evolutionary transition from single cells to multicellular mycelium, composed of fibrous hyphae. So let's begin. At the very root of the fungal family tree were the first ancestors of the entire kingdom, branched off from the rest of earthly life. Well, it was a mess. It was a total mess. I mean, the fungal evolution itself wasn't a mess. It was, uh, it was elegant, it was just as perfectly diverse, and uh, it worked just like the evolution of any other species, and it fit quite nicely into the laws of physics and chemistry. It's our understanding of this early evolution that's a total mess. The early fungal family tree, as we've documented it, as we've studied the, f the fungal lineage, is, I mean, that, what we know of the family tree is anything but clean and simple. It's confusing. It's frustrating, and the ordering of clades changes from source to source, because the data is relatively sparse and incomplete, and so, you know, any groundbreaking new study can have a disproportionately large effect in the field. For example, in the Tree of Life project, which cited multiple studies from 2005 and 2006, these studies found that the cryptomycota were on the very edge of the fungal kingdom. The chytrids and the neocalamistigomycota were closely related, and they didn't even know where to place the microsporidia. And then, in 2014, there was a textbook, The Tree of Life, which uh, in chapter 15 depicts a family tree of the fungi, and at its earliest stages, it depicts microsporidia and cryptomycota as one closely related pair, and the chytrids and the neocalamistigomycota as another closely related pair. But then, there was a paper that was published in 2017 in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and in that paper, none of these groups are depicted as being closely related. The microsporidia and the neocalamistigomycota are somewhat closely related, but they're somewhat far from the cryptomycota and the chytrids, which are themselves depicted as being extremely closely related. Now, these are just three examples, but there's a lot more. I mean, I'm really just skimming the surface of this fungal enigma. The entire field is just full of fascinating mysteries. And if you just listened to episode 67 on fungal evolution, then you should remember that I discussed the relative lack of fungal fossils from the ancient past. This isn't to say that fungi just didn't exist until evolutionarily recently. It's just that they don't fossilize easily. They decay very quickly. So, we have very little data relative to animals or plants, for example. And now, as we try and organize the fungal kingdom into a consistent family tree, we have to rely on genetic analysis of extant species. And this has finally made it easy, <laughs> relatively speaking, to understand the Basidiomycota and the Ascomycota, which are two large groups that I'll be exploring in future episodes. But even this genetic data is of limited use when trying to understand the primitive basal fungi. Things get more complicated, because the earliest fungi were single-celled organisms, and just like bacteria, 
many of these early species could engage in lateral gene transfer. This fact alone shrouds the early evolution of the fungi in an almost impenetrable fog. So at this point, the question for me becomes, what do I do here? How can I present the early evolution of the fungal kingdom if it's ridiculously complicated, and the experts themselves haven't even reached consensus on a lot of important issues? Well, I'm just going to try and keep it as simple as I can. I'm going to try and use the most recent studies, and the most recent genetic data, and the most recent comprehensive interpretations, to the best of my ability. And that way, I can at least pretend that I'm being accurate and you can be reasonably sure that what you're hearing is accurate, to the best of our knowledge, at the end of the second decade of the 21st century. I also have to explain all of this because, well, I mean, if I didn't, I would just feel like I was leaving out some really important contextual details, and that would make what I'm trying to explain a little less clear, and, you know, no one wants that. So let's start for real this time. So let's start with what we know. I'm going to begin this exploration of fungal evolution with the Opistheconta. This is an ancient grouping, far older than the Cambrian explosion. And in its most general description, the base Opistheconts are single-celled microbes equipped with some kind of flagella. Some species have just one flagella, others have multiple flagella, while others have strangely shaped or positioned flagella. This flagella trait is retained in the fungi that produce flagellated spores, or gametes, as well as the animal gamete called sperm. This flagellation, or the trait of having a flagella, makes the opisthoconts distinct from plants, with the rare exception of some algaes. Most of the universally encompassing traits that make plants and opisthoconts distinct exist on a molecular level. For example, plants all share fused thymidylate synthase and dihydrofolate reductase enzymes, which opisthoconts don't have. And opisthoconts all share fused dihydroorotase, aspartate carbamoyl transferase, and carbamoyl phosphate synthetase enzymes, all of which plants don't have. But these details are largely unimportant, and I won't go into them much deeper than that for today's episode. Now, during the hundreds of millions of years of opisthocont evolution, they diverged into two groups, which would themselves continue to diversify and form massively diverse family trees. One branch of opisthocons was the holozoa, which would evolve to form all of the animals, as well as a plethora of animal-like clades, including the coanoflagellates and the dermatocystida. The other branch was the holomycota, which includes all the fungi and a wide range of fungal protozoa. One of the earliest branching groups in the holomycota was a group of single-celled eukaryotic organisms that evolved to reproduce with spores. These spores are very tiny because they're being produced and secreted by single cells, and this led to them being named microsporidia. These super-primitive fungi are eukaryotes, but along their billion-year evolutionary journey, they've lost some of the hallmark eukaryotic traits, like mitochondria and external structures used for motility. It turns out that their mitochondria has actually been extensively reworked, to the point where it, it, it actually doesn't generate energy through oxidative phosphorylation. What used to be mitochondria have now been evolved into the smaller, mysterious mitosome which isn't that well understood. Effectively, what this means is that the microsporidia are anaerobic. And as for their DNA, they've lost so much over their evolutionary history that now they have some of the smallest genomes among all eukaryotes. They also appear to be able to engage in horizontal gene transfer, as they share a discrete number of bacterial genes and genes from other fungi, and even some genes from animals. These microsporidia can sustain themselves on this small, weird genome because they're mostly parasites, who outsource a lot of their needs to their host. They're brutally effective parasites, too. They enter the body, usually through ingestion through the mouth, where they end up in the gut, 
and there the spores start to germinate. The spores are almost like little blasting caps, or like a mix between a remote detonator and a hypodermic needle. During germination, the internal pressure of the spore builds until they rupture at their weakest point. And at this specific point on the spore wall, there's an evolutionarily designed structure that shapes and directs the powerful pressure release. This is used to propel a filament structure outward, like a hypodermic needle. The intense force enables the filament to pierce the soft plasma membranes of the host cells along the gut epithelium. It will then inject DNA and supplementary proteins called infection factors. The infection factors are now in the host cell, so now they'll start to replicate and grow into a sporoplasm, which turns into a larger structure called a plasmodium. This is where the microsporidia begin to appear remarkably similar to the other fungi. This plasmodium is a net-like or web-like structure of continuous cytoplasm-filled tubes, all interconnecting and interwoven, and inside them are numerous nuclei that float through the structure, unrestricted by cell membranes. This web-like structure of interconnecting tubes begins to grow and creep throughout the host cell and out into nearby cells, exploiting the host's enzymatic machinery for nutrients and energy. They ultimately spread to every tissue and infect every organ. These infections can cause intense diseases with horrible symptoms that affect the entire body, like lower body weight in some cases, and gigantism in others, as well as lower fertility or even parasitic castration, alteration of the host's sex, a shorter lifespan, and a general lack of energy and motivation. The microsporidia infect animals, and virtually every major group in the animal kingdom has at least one microsporidia species that can infect it. They mostly infect insects, but they also infect their crustacean cousins, as well as fish. Microsporidia can also be hyperparasites, which means that they can parasitize animals that parasitize on other animals. For example, there's a group of flatworms called digenians which parasitize mollusks, among many other kinds of animals. As a digenean flatworm parasitizes the inner gut of a mollusk, they themselves can be infected by microsporidian parasites, which means these microsporidia are hyperparasites. That's, that's pretty hardcore. Now, humans can also be parasitized by microsporidium, including the species Silenensis and the species Africanum, which leads to a condition called microsporidosis. It's pretty awful as it induces painful and frequent diarrhea and generalized wasting, which is where your body just kind of wastes away. Anyway, the established plasmodium structure produces more microsporidia cells and more spores, so as to continue to grow and propagate itself. Some microsporidia species can reproduce asexually, simply by perpetuating themselves with their own spores. But in many other species, mating is much more complicated. Some microsporidia aren't asexual. They reproduce sexually with other compatible mating types, and their spores, or their plasmodium structures, have to physically meet and interact with each other inside a host. Some species have life cycles and mating strategies that involve multiple hosts, and it all gets very complicated. In this sense, you can see how microsporidia reproduction is similar to reproduction in the more classical fungi. Some are asexual, some can reproduce asexually and sexually, and some are sexual, with a wide diversity of methods and strategies. While the microsporidia are parasitic and almost universally damaging, as they evolved and diversified, some populations branched out and found new ecological niches. For example, there were the emergent Neocala mastigomycata, which live inside the guts of large herbivores, like reptiles and mammals. Except, instead of being harmful parasites like the microsporidia, the Neocala mastigomycata are beneficial symbiotic fungi that help the animal digest plant fiber. They express enzymes that use hydrolysis reactions 
to break down a wide variety of sugar polymers, making them really effective symbionts for their large herbivorous host. These two groups of fungal protozoa are closely related, and as such, they have several key similarities. For example, they're both single-celled organisms that depend on a host animal to survive. But more importantly, they both don't have mitochondria. In the microsporidia, the mitochondria have withered and lost their function, becoming a mitosome. And now, we aren't quite sure what it does. Neocalamostegomycota also don't have mitochondria. They have something called a hydrogenosome. This structure is also an evolutionary derivative of the mitochondria, but over evolutionary time, it's been reformatted. The Neocalamostegomycota use these hydrogenosomes to engage in an altered, limited kind of cellular respiration. It doesn't use oxygen, but it does produce a little bit of ATP, and some hydrogen and CO2 as waste. Both of these unicellular eukaryotic groups are anaerobic. And so they've undergone deep evolutionary changes to accommodate their largely anaerobic life cycle. Now those are some similarities, but these are also diverging groups, so naturally there's going to be some differences too. One of the major differences that I've already mentioned is how the microsporidia are parasitic, while the neocalamostegomycota are generally mutualist symbiotes. This is an example of an evolutionary shift into a new ecological niche, with the ecology being the environment inside of the body of its animal host. There's other differences too. For example, both groups use spores to reproduce, but the spores are wildly different. Microsporidia release tiny spores that act like a creepy mix of landmine and hypodermic needle to spread their genes and infect their host. It's almost like a virus. The Neocalamostegomycota, on the other hand, produce zoospores, which are spores equipped with a large number of flagella. This wad of flagella looks kind of like a horse's tail, and the zoospore whips the group of them back and forth to swim through the water. The life cycle goes something like this. The animal host eats some plant matter, like some shoots and leaves of, uh, of a bush or a tree or something and all of this chewed up plant matter will get brought into the gut, where it's exposed to the symbiotic fungi. The Neocalamostegomycota can sense chemical cues from this broken up plant matter, and this will spur them into action. Zoospores will approach the plant material and attach themselves to the surface. This is the, the surface of the plant material, mind you, not the surface of the herbivore's gut. So once the zoospores have attached themselves to the chewed-up plant material, thin, hyphae-like filaments called rhizoids begin to spread out from the zoospore and penetrate and permeate through the plant matter. These can then release chemicals that break down the plant fibers from the inside out, so as to assist the herbivore's digestion. The rhizoids are breaking down the plant tissue and returning some nutrients to the original zoospore structure. The zoospore needs these nutrients because it's undergoing a critical maturation process. The original body of the zoospore is expanding into a large sac or spherical globular container that's filled with new zoospores. When the mature sporangia receive another chemical signal that there's yet another bolus of plant matter coming into the gut, the zoospore-filled sac is released, it's burst open, its walls will eventually dissolve, and all of the new zoospores being grown inside of it, they will all get released into the gut. They follow the chemical cues from the plant matter, they embed themselves, and they grow their new rhizoids, and the process repeats itself. This is how these gut fungi engage in a mutualist symbiosis with their herbivore host. So these are just a couple of the mini fungal protozoa, which are a wide clade of simple organisms sourced from the earliest evolutionary branches, among which just one would eventually give rise to the true fungi. As we walk closer to these true fungi, we'll come to a small intermediate group called the cryptomycota, or the hidden fungi. This clade includes a single class, the Rosellidae, with a single order, the Rosellidae. 
This small cluster of species are either fungi or a sister group immediately adjacent to the fungi, in which case they would bridge the gap between the fungal protozoa and the true fungi. Many of the sources that I looked at during my research placed Rosellida in different places, and others said that they simply had an undetermined placement. They're called cryptomycota, and that's a pretty obvious pun because they're very cryptic. They are very mysterious and, and hard to figure out. And yet, despite this intermediate position, the cryptomycota have a curious evolutionary quirk. While every other fungal species possesses genes for producing chitin, and they actively express chitin, the cryptomycota have virtually shut down their chitin production. They still have the genes for it, and chitin even gets expressed in the resting spores, but the living organisms themselves haven't ever been seen to express it. They don't have chitinous cell walls. This is really interesting, because it's a huge departure from typical fungal evolution, where chitin is a polymer that's almost fundamental to their cell wall physiology and to their, uh, to their ecological role. You know, it plays some part in their body structure and how they can engage with the world around them, like a, like a plant symbiote, for example. But it turns out that cryptomycota have adapted to a particular evolutionary niche where chitin is not an advantage. They've adapted to be intracellular parasites. The structural rigidity and the stiffness of a chitinous cell wall is too restrictive and impeding for the cryptomycota as they feed by phagocytosis. They feed by extending these large prongs of membrane and cytoplasm outwards to wrap around a food particle and envelop it completely. By engulfing the food particle, it gets completely absorbed into the cell, where it can be broken down. This amorphous quality would be prohibited if the cryptomycota had a more rigid chitinous cell wall. Alright, so as I've been moving through the holomycota protozoa, and now that we've come up to the cryptomycota, we're moving into the territory of the true fungi. From here forward, the fungal kingdom really begins to crystallize. Things get a little clearer, and the evolutionary relationships are a little more refined and well understood. We also start to see the emergence of traits that are more or less universal and defining of the fungal kingdom. Exceptions do exist, but from here forward, things are going to get a lot more consistent. So, very closely related to the cryptomycota and within the monocaria, or the true fungi, we have the chytridiomycota, or the chytrids. These things are all saprobes, which means that they can consume dead biomatter by secreting chemicals to break it down outside their bodies. These chytrids are all saprobes, which means that they digest their food outside of their body. Whatever their food is, whether it's like infected, uh, dying, or dead biomatter, the chytrids will release enzymes outside of their body that break down this, this organic tissue. And then, when it's all broken down into a nutrient-rich soup, they can absorb stuff. And they, they absorb nutrients. And so they digest everything externally, and then absorb what they produce. Many of the chytrids are also parasites. The chytrids are really where things start to get really exciting, and it's where the fungi start to show just how weird they really are. So, as we go up through the family tree of the fungi through the rest of this series, you'll really get to see just how weird they can get. The general life cycle of the chytrids involves producing asexual zoospores, which will form asexual zoosporangium, which will mature until it can produce more zoospores, and so on and so forth. That's the basic gist of it. The majority of chytrids are asexual, and they reproduce in this way. But a minority of them reproduce sexually, and they do it in a wide variety of weird and wacky ways. Some species do it by releasing gametes into their watery habitat, which will drift around before coming into contact with compatible gametes, which will then fertilize and produce a new individual. Other species reproduce when two individuals meet in close proximity and extend small tubes towards each other. The tubes will meet and fuse, creating a shared internal cavity. The gametes are exchanged through these conjoined tubes in a kind of controlled internal fertilization. 
In an even stranger kind of sexual reproduction, there are some chytrids that form sporangia, or like a, a kind of mycelial-like mass that grows in a substrate. Sometimes these sporangia will grow specialized structures called rhizoids, which help to anchor them to the substrate, to the, to the surface that they're growing on. They're mostly composed of just extended cells, so the rhizoid itself is essentially just a bunch of tubes filled with cytoplasm. Each parent chytrid releases a gamete, which will then flow down the rhizoid tubes to meet at some point of conjoinment. And here, this, this fertilization creates a resting spore, which will eventually produce a new individual. The sporangium itself is the main body of the chytrid fungi, which will swell up as it fills with zoospores. Fun fact, this structure is what gives chytrids their name, as the, the bloated, spore-filled sporangium sac looks kind of like a little pot, or in Greek, a chytridium. Now, there's two types of body form. You have holocarpic body forms and eucarpic body forms. The holocarpic body form involves just the bulbous sporangium filled with the zoospores. It rests within the infected host cell with its little discharge tube poking out to blast all the zoospores out into the intercellular space, out into the host tissues. And so, so this is the holocarpic form. The eucarpic body form includes the sporangia in the rhizoids, which extend into the host cell to anchor the sporangia in place. Now this gets a little more detailed, as there's three different types of eucarpic body form. First, there's the eucarpic polycentric body form, where the sporangium is embedded within the host cells, and it grows huge complexes of thick rhizoids that are more like a true mycelium than just basic rhizoids. And from this rhizomycelium, more sporangia can be grown, so as to maximize the production of spores. These are called polycentric, because a single spore can produce multiple sporangia. The other two chytrid body forms are monocentric, meaning one spore produces only one sporangia, so these body forms are generally simpler and less extensive. They are the epibiotic body form, where the sporangium is outside of the host cell, but the, the rhizoids can extend within the host cell like an anchor or some kind of protruding sensor to keep it bound to the surface. And you also have the endobiotic body form, where the sporangium is inside the host cell, much like the rhizoids. It's all submerged into the membrane and cytoplasm. Now, if it wasn't clear just how diverse these chytrids are, they don't even release their zoospores in the same way. Some of them have a little tube with a lid called an operculum. The operculum is lifted or opened, and the zoospores just spill out, either in part or in their entirety. But other chytrids don't have operculum. They have pores, or slits, through which they secrete their zoospores. These chytrids live in marine and terrestrial environments, although they're particularly dependent on water, so they struggle to live in extremely dry places. Some of them are also parasites, which saprophytically feed on plants or animals. Now, there's a group of fungi that were once thought to be chytrids, as they shared similar habitats and they included many parasites among their ranks. But upon further analysis, they were determined to be a similar but genetically distinct group. This group is the Blastocladiomycetes, or for short, the Blastoclads. If you thought that the chytrids were interesting, the Blastoclads really crank it up to 11. These are the first fungi to exhibit a phenomenon called alternation of generations. Now, before I get going on this, I'll return to alternation of generations, but before I get going, I should mention that, like the chytrids, the blastoclads include species that can reproduce sexually, but the majority reproduce asexually. Asexual reproduction is really similar to chytrid asexual reproduction, with the added detail that sometimes the zoospores of asexual blastoclads can meet and fuse and go so far as to actually exchange cytoplasm but they don't actually exchange or fuse nuclei. They don't go through with it and fully sexually reproduce. This is kind of strange and unique, and if we can learn anything from this, my initial impression is that it's an example of an asexual process that shows strong evolutionary potential 
for mutating into a sexual process. In other words, this might give us a functional clue as to how sexual replication originally evolved. Okay, so blastoclad sexual reproduction is defined by something called alternation of generations. As the lineage replicates itself, it will alternate between a haploid gametophyte body form and a diploid sporophyte body form. The gametophyte has one copy of its genome, so it's haploid, and it reproduces through mitosis to produce gametes. These are basically just flakes of its body, as all of its cells are haploid, just like a gamete. The gametes simply have to come into contact with other haploid gametes, and they fertilize to create the diploid sporophyte. The sporophyte begins as a zygote. Its cells will divide by mitosis to create its mature body form, and some of its cells will divide by meiosis to produce spores. These haploid spores will land somewhere that's viable for life, and they'll replicate through mitosis, and they'll produce another gametophyte. In this way, the process goes back and forth as the greater biochemical lineage replicates and perpetuates itself. It's a cellular alternation that's present in each generation. It's an alternation of generations. Many of the higher fungi exhibit this trait, but the blastoclads are, evolutionarily speaking, the first to do so. There's another cool example of blastoclads showing a kind of evolutionary foreshadowing. In the genus Alamyces, the gametophyte body form takes the shape of an erect column, and at the top, there are branching structures that end in gametangia, or masses of gamete-producing cells. These gametangia, which can be male or female, produce their respective types of gametes. I use this as an example of evolutionary foreshadowing because what other fungal organ can you think of that has a columnar shape, with spore-producing tissues at its tip? The answer should be obvious. The mushroom. These mushroom fruiting bodies exist in the Basidiomycota, among others, which I'll discuss in future episodes. Alright, so speaking of future episodes, I'm almost near the end of this one. The last group that I want to talk about today are the zygomycota, or the zygote fungi. This is the simplest fungal group where, where we can really start to see all of the lovely hallmarks of the true fungi, including the hyphae and mycelia. So let's start with the basics. Like the chytrids and the blastoclads, the zygomycota can live in marine and terrestrial habitats. They have species that are saprobes and species that are parasites. Most of their species reproduce asexually, but some of their species reproduce sexually. Now, in a minority of the species that reproduce sexually, their gametophyte generation has a biological sex, and they produce male and female gametes. A terpenoid, called trisporic acid, is used as a hormone to regulate sexual differentiation. There's a neat little synthesis pathway for trisporic acid, beginning with beta-carotene being turned into retinol, which is then turned into beta-C18 ketone, which is then thought to go through a modular synthesis pathway with five intermediary molecules before trisporic acid is finally synthesized. All of these trisported derivatives that are produced along the way are used in pheromone signaling between compatible sexes. The pheromone is released into the environment, and as it diffuses outward, a concentration gradient appears in the, in the air or the water. If a potential mate senses the pheromone, they can follow it where it gets stronger. They can move up the concentration gradient to its source, which will eventually allow for the individuals to, uh, to come into contact and meet, and this allows for the merging of gametangia to produce a new zygote. The last thing that I want to talk about today is a defining trait of the zygomycetes, which is their zygophores. Imagine you're holding a piece of fruit that's being fed upon by several zygomycot fungi. These fungi are compatible mating types, and as their mycelia creep across the surface of the fruit, they're also trying to mate with each other. You'll see what appears to be fuzz, or thin hairs, growing upwards from the mycelia. Sometimes these small hairs will have very tiny little globules, or sphericals, on their tips. These thin columnar structures, these, these zygophores, are the mating organs of the sexual zygomycota. They release trisporic acid and its precursors 
to chemically attract the zygophores of compatible mating types. When they meet, they physically fuse and exchange genetic information to create a zygote. In asexual zygomycotes, they still have these tall, thin, filament-like reproductive structures tipped with little spheres, but they don't fuse with compatible mating types. Because they're asexual, they just produce spores on their own. Chlamydospores are used to extend the mycelium and help perpetuate it. Mitospores are produced en masse, in thin, fragile containers that rupture easily so that they can disperse the spores into the environment. Because the zygomycota mostly prefer to live on dry land, their reproductive structures have adapted to the physical reality of a terrestrial habitat. For example, they respond to light. Various wavelengths, particularly blue light, can regulate development, can regulate sex organ growth, and even metabolic activity. Various wavelengths can influence the timing of sporulation, and even the size of spores that get produced. The columns are also filled with cells that can sense gravity. They have internal vacuoles, or internal spaces filled with cytoplasm. Embedded within the vacuole are protein crystals, and these protein crystals will precipitate out of the cytoplasm and sink to the bottom of the vacuole. They will then apply a pressure to the bottom of the vacuole, which gives a sense of directionality. It, it allows the fungi to orient itself with respect to gravity. They can sense gravity. I talked about this in much greater detail in my episode on fungal sensoria, but for this episode, I think I've gone on for long enough, so I'm going to wrap it up here. It was my intention that this episode illustrates the slow, evolutionary shift from microbial protozoa to true fungi with mycelia, hyphae, complex mating strategies, and complex symbiotic relationships. If you enjoyed this episode, then hit the like button. And if you enjoy all my content generally, then subscribe to the channel. You know, I post new stuff pretty regularly. And, as always, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.